So in part one, we talked about how Stannis has the Hill Tribes, House Glover, and House Mormont on his side. However, a missing flint calls into question their loyalty. Lucky for Stannis, the Manderleys and the Umbers are also conspiring against the Boltons. The Umbers even have a hidden army out there. However, the two houses haven't been the most forthcoming with information. So besides some Skagosi showing up or House Reed coming out of friggin' nowhere, can Stannis rely on anyone else? Well, Roose Bolton is no dummy. He says flat out that he doesn't trust the Manderleys or the Umbers, and he says that the Serwins and the Tallhearts aren't to be relied on. Theon has a very similar assessment, adding on House Hornwood, Flint, and Risewell. So let's start out by talking about the Tallhearts, Serwins, and Hornwoods. During the War of the Five Kings, Roose Bolton has been doing a great job at killing off the Northmen. At the Battle of the Green Fork, Tyrion spots Serwins, Hornwoods, Karstarks, and Glovers, but weirdly no Boltons. They must have been in the rear. Then at the Siege of Winterfell, Theon sees mainly Serwins, Tallhearts, and Manderleys. At Duskendale, we mainly have Tallhearts and Glovers. The point being, the Tallhearts, Serwin, and Hornwood forces have been thoroughly spent. Not to mention, they have no leadership left. Lord Tallheart was killed at Duskendale, and his son was killed by the Iron Men. His daughter is held captive by the Iron Men. Lord Serwin died of wounds he got at the Battle of the Green Fork, and his son was killed at the Sack of Winterfell. His daughter is alive, but she wasn't invited to the wedding. Lord Hornwood was killed at the Battle of the Green Fork. His son was killed at the Battle of the Whispering Wood. And Lady Hornwood was murdered by Ramsay. The point being, even if the Tallhearts, Serwins, and Hornwoods don't like the Boltons, they don't have the strength or leadership to be a significant threat. And the Manderley-Umber conspiracy doesn't seem to go further than that, as Mance and his washerwomen then murder someone from House Risewell, House Frey, House Flint, and House Bolton. So Stannis doesn't seem to have anyone else conspiring for him, but that doesn't necessarily mean there aren't other people conspiring. House Flint is interesting in that it has branches in three locations, at Widow's Watch, at Flint's Finger, and among the Mountain Clans. If unified, this would give them incredible position to watch the North. Flint's Finger would watch the Sunset Sea, Widow's Watch would watch the Narrow Sea, and the First Flint's would watch the King's Road and the Wall. And watching is certainly what the Flint's have been doing. Robin Flint acts as a scout for Rob's campaign and stays close to Rob. He even travels with Catelyn when she goes down to meet with Renly Baratheon. Widow's Watch observes Stannis' ship movements, and Old Flint is sent to the Wall to observe the Fen Karstark wedding. The Flint's act as scouts for Stannis as well, and one disappears from his march. And of course, the Flint's are watching the action in Winterfell. They aren't trusted like the Risewells and Dustins, but they aren't mistrusted like the Umbers and Manderleys. So whose side are the Flint's on? They seem to dislike Stannis' Red God, but then again they lost people at the Red Wedding and have reason to hate the Boltons. The Flint's seem thoroughly annoyed at Jon Snow's action as Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, and they seem to have a history of problems with House Stark. Old Flint says that wards were taken from them, and Mance murders a Flint in Winterfell, meaning they're probably not part of the Manderley umber conspiracy. Now it may be that the Flint's aren't unified, or maybe they're hedging their bets but it seems that something else is going on with them. It should be noted that the Flints have an old and strong connection to the Wall and the Night's Watch. The Night's Watch has a barracks called Flint's Barracks. There's the old tale of Danny Flint. Byam Flint was a ranger at Shadow Tower. An old Flint commander tried to become king beyond the Wall, and many people suspect that a Flint was the Night's King. The point being, while other houses may be concerned with lordship and kingship and inheritance and fealty, the Flints are probably more concerned with the Others, and magic and prophecy. After all, a flint in Winterfell mentions the Horn of Joramon bringing down the walls of Winterfell. That's a piece of magic only the wildlings should know about. The story goes that the horn wakes giants, so the flints have access to knowledge north of the wall. And since we've only heard about them here or there in battle, it stands to reason that they have plenty of forces in reserve. And speaking of unspent forces, let's talk about House Dustin and House Risewell. In all of the warring of a Game of Thrones, a Clash of Kings, and a Storm of Swords, these two houses do not make an appearance. Lady Dustin, who is by birth a Risewell, tells us why. She says she sent the minimum number of forces she dared to because she hates the Starks and is conspiring against them. Why would she do that? Well, House Dustin are lords of the Barrowlands, which is home of the grave of the first king of the north. The Risewells used to own the Barrowlands, so it may be that they were the kings of the north before the Starks. Whatever the case, the Risewells tried to get their daughter, Barbary Risewell, who became Lady Dustin, to marry Brandon Stark. 
However, the Starks had Southern ambitions. Cattle and Tully became the focus of the Stark boys. So rather than getting Winterfell, the Risewells focused on getting their ancestral home of the Barrowlands back. So Barbary Risewell married Lord Dustin. Now, Lord Dustin died at the Tower of Joy. But weirdly, Barbary didn't remarry in 17 years. Now, of course, remarrying would allow another house to take control of the Barrowlands. So whatever house Risewell is up to, the Barrowlands are essential to it. Now, interestingly, Melisandre has a vision about the Risewell conspiracy. She sees the Risewells, the Hornwoods, the Sirwins, the Tallhearts, and the Dustins meeting in Barrowton. So that's no Flints and no Boltons. So what could they be talking about? Well, in the crypts of Winterfell, Lady Dustin shows some disdain for the Stark King who knelt for the Targaryens. So the houses may be discussing the restoration of a Risewell King with their seat in Barrowton. That seems much more likely than the houses conspiring to put douchebag Boltons and Freys in power. So in the end, it doesn't look like the Boltons have very many friends, which is to be expected. The Boltons have showed nothing but cruelty and betrayal to the other houses. So, what's Bolton's plan? Yes, Bolton forces outnumber everyone else at Winterfell, but is that really a long-term strategy? The Risewells and Dustins are likely to have the largest combined force in the North, so if Roos has long-term plans, he needs Risewell and Dustin buy-in. But weirdly, Roos keeps around this asshole, Ramsay Bolton. Roos says that Ramsay is going to murder his children. At the same time, he says that Ramsay isn't fit to rule the North. And Roos's only trusted allies, the Risewells and Dustins, absolutely hate Ramsay. And the feeling is mutual. Ramsay says he plans on burning Barrowton down. It seems completely illogical that Roos would expect Ramsay to lead House Bolton in the future. Ramsay is completely hostile to the Risewells and Dustins, who Roos absolutely needs. This has led some to believe that Roos is going to sacrifice Ramsay and maybe steal his body or something. But would Ramsay really be the best person to sacrifice? As we know, Melisandre says there's power in the blood of kings, and Roos went way out of his way to kill a king himself at the Red Wedding. So if Roos is up to anything magical, it seems that killing a king would be part of this. We know that king's blood yields magical results, and we know that Roos Bolton is interested in killing kings. And guess who happens to attend the wedding? A house that happens to contain the first kings of the north. And I'd like to point out that the roof of the Great Hall was hastily erected, the roof of the hastily constructed stables has already collapsed, killing a bunch of horses. So when people ask, is there a Great Northern Conspiracy, I say, yeah, there's about five of them. But it all ends with the following dynamic. We have the Boltons and Risewells facing off within Winterfell, and then we have Stannis and the Manderleys sandwiching the phrase outside of Winterfell. The wild cards are the Flints, the Hidden Umber Army, and the Others. That's right, since dragons are part of the Battle of Fire, I see the Others as possibly showing up to the Battle of Ice maybe making it there through Gorn's way. But no talk of Winterfell would be complete without talking about the Hooded Man. In our story, a mysterious Hooded Man arrives in Winterfell with some important news. Whatever the news was, it leads to the murder of Little Walder, which causes a fight to break out between the Freys and the Manderleys. Both houses are expelled from Winterfell to fight Stannis. So what could the news be? Could it be news of Rob's will? Unlikely. The Freys likely have the will itself, meaning they'd be the last people you'd want to piss off by sending off into the snow. Could it be news of Great John Umber's transfer? Well, if that were the case, why aren't the Umbers being sent outside? When it comes down to it, Rickon's return is the only news that makes sense. It pushes the Manderleys fully on Stannis' side, per their agreement, and it creates a rift between Ramsay and the Freys. Keep in mind the Freys are fully expecting to inherit the Dreadfort, with Ramsay inheriting Winterfell. If Winterfell isn't in the picture, there's a dispute. And so Roos's order to send the Freys and the Manderleys outside is a clever way to get rid of his problems. And so if the news is about the Manderleys and Rickon's return, Robert Glover is probably the hooded man. And this melds nicely with the idea that Theon is actually a kinslayer. What do I mean by that? Well, remember those Miller's boys that Theon kills in A Clash of Kings? Well, it turns out Theon was banging the Miller's wife. So there's a chance that the younger child's actually Theon's. Theon feels pretty damn guilty about those murders, so much so that he talks and screams in his sleep. So there's a chance that Wex found out about them. And then Robet Glover ends up interviewing Wex. The word Kinslayer is then used by the Hooded Man, who is probably Robet, as well as Rowan, one of Mance's spearwives, and Crowsfruit Umber. These three people all seem to be part of the Manderly Umber conspiracy. And so I have to say there's a lot going on in the North but nothing that really points to a single unified conspiracy. It's an absolute mess, which is what makes it so darn interesting. But what do I know? I'm probably wrong about half of this. And next time we'll talk about... Who are the Brotherhood Without Banners? Really?